Hi class and welcome to lecture eight. Today we're going to be discussing Congress. This will be our first lecture out of our three branches of government. You'll have to excuse my voice. I am running a little bit of a head cold, um, but let's try to get through this together. Um, so before we get into kind of the nitty gritty um, about Congress, I want to discuss with you something called democratic theory, which is important of course in any democratic institution that is ruled majority with protection of minority rights. And when the power is invested in the people and exercised either directly through them or by chosen representatives, why do I bring this up? Why is it important? Of course, democratic theory is what a democracy is at heart. And I bring this up in relation to Congress because our legislative branch, our Congress satisfies democratic theory. In the United States, which is a democratic republic, we satisfy democratic theory through our legislative branch, okay? Now, there are many duties and responsibilities of Congress, of the legislative branch, but perhaps their most important responsibility is lawmaking. And we're gonna get into more of what they do later on in the lectures, but first I wanna talk about some of the powers that they have. Now, Congress is a very powerful branch of government, and when we read the Founding Fathers' writings, Many of them envisioned that Congress would be the most powerful branch of government. I'll leave it up to you to decide if that's the case today. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But Congress does have a lot of powers. And we're going to break them up into four different categories. Financial, legal, institutional, and powers of national defense. So let's get a little more in detail on these. Starting with financial powers. <coughs> Excuse me. The power to tax, the power to borrow and, and pay back those debts to regulate trade and commerce, right? Um, also included in that is the power to create a national budget. So the Congress determines how much they're gonna tax its citizens, us, and where that money is going to go towards, right? Ultimately, it will be approved by the president, like any law, uh, but that is a huge major responsibility. Also, it's a check on other branches of government. If an executive agency is behaving in a way that Congress does not like, they can choose to cut their funding or defund them. That's going to be a major blow to that organization. So financial powers are quite large in Congress. Next, we have legal powers. What legal powers does Congress have? Well, they have a lot, and some of them are more important than others. Um, power to create law is obviously the most important, perhaps. Um, but also issue money, as we stated before, create certain standards and practices, patent systems. But perhaps most importantly, they have the power to impeach presidents and federal judges. With judges, they also have the power to approve a, a nominee appointees. Okay, so everyone listening to this lecture has lived through an impeachment. In fact, two impeachments. Right, President Donald Trump became the first president uh, to be impeached twice. So you've seen that happen. Um, we've discussed the impeachment process a little bit. We're not going to go into too much detail today, but that is an important legal power that Congress does, an important check on the executive branch. <clears throat> Next, we have institutional powers of Congress, powers to organize the other branches of government. For example, Congress can determine how many Supreme Court justices there should be. Right, there's currently nine, it's been that way for quite a while, but um, <clears throat> that can be adjusted if Congress so wishes. Um, they have the power to admit new states, which is also a huge deal, and manage US territories. Of course, admitting new states, it's still a relevant topic when we talk about things, a place like Puerto Rico and some of our other territories, not as relevant as it was you know, uh, prior to the Civil War with the great expansion westward, et cetera. Powers of national defense. This is important. Only Congress has the power to declare war. The president, the executive, does not have the power to declare war. So the US has been um, involved in a lot of wars, technically, but does anyone know the last time Congress actually declared war? I'll give you a second to think about it. It's actually World War II. The last time Congress declared war, was World War II. I mean, since then, we've had the Korean War, we've had the Vietnam War, we've had tons of conflicts and skirmishes. Um, you know, we've had um, Iraq, and, Iraq and then Afghanistan and Iraq again, right? Uh, tons of wars, many of which have 
lasted probably longer than some of you have been alive. But technically, I mean, were they wars? Yes, but technically, Congress never declared war in those instances. So kind of an interesting fact there, <coughs> excuse me. Um, they also have the power to fund military forces, et cetera. Other powers that Congress has that are worth mentioning, um, additional powers can be given to Congress through amendments, right? So Congress can vote to give itself additional powers so long as the states go along with it. Examples of that would be the 13th through 15th amendments, which included in the verbiage authorized Congress to enforce the civil rights laws they passed in those three amendments. So let's get some key terms out of the way, which will be important for when we hear this lecture and just for understanding um, when people talk about Congress, when they say the floor, they simply mean the full chamber of the House or the Senate. So when all the members are together in the House or the Senate, they call that the floor. And this is where ultimately the groups will go to debate and ultimately vote on whether a bill should become a law or not. So that's the congressional floor, the full chamber of the House or the Senate. Another term you might hear quite often is congressional caucus. This is simply a group, a group in either the House or the Senate. Remember, we have a bicameral legislature, meaning there's two levels. You have the House representatives, that's the lower house, and you have the Senate, which is the upper house, okay? Um, the, the House has more members, shorter terms. The Senate has less members, um, more, but a more powerful House than the House of Representatives, a more powerful chamber, I should say. Um, but anyways, a congressional caucus is simply a group who meets in either one of these uh, chambers to discuss common interests, whether that be race, gender, geography, right? You might have a women's caucus, a black caucus, et cetera. Like-minded individuals meet together to discuss common interests. That's what congressional caucus is. So as I said before, I kind of uh, spoiled this, but we have a bicameral legislature. We have the Senate and the House of Representatives. We're gonna break these down into two groups and talk about them individually. Let's start with the House of Representatives. There are 435 members in the House of Representatives. Um, every state is representative, represented, not representative, that makes no sense, is represented and they serve two-year terms, which is not very long. And if you think about it, two year terms, I mean, it takes about a year to plan an election. So if you're in the House of Representatives, you know, if you're Nancy Pelosi, if you're AOC, if you're any of these people, um, you're almost constantly running for reelection, which must be just nauseating to, to keep uh, going. It must be like Groundhog Day. Now, the number of, vote, of seats, I should say, that a state gets is based on their population, okay? Now there are six non-voting delegates from US territories. We're not gonna get too much into that, but just so you're aware. So let's take a look at this map. I just updated this actually last year um, because they do the census every 10 years in this country. What the census is essentially is counting people, determining what states people are living in, if they're moving, if people are being born, dying, et cetera. And then based on this census, based on this count of people, the reapportion house seats so it's more accurate. Now, there is no bottom limit except one. So very unpopular, unpopular states like North and South Dakota, Wyoming, for example, only get a minimum of one House seat. So they'll actually have less seats in the Senate than, or in the House than they will in the Senate, which is the Senate, everyone gets two seats. Now, <clears throat> excuse me again. What's interesting is from the 2010 to the 2020 census, California actually lost a seat in the House of Representatives. We lost the seat. And what's spectacular about that, or in the sense that it's um, unique, is that's the first time in California history that has ever happened. The first time California has ever lost a seat in the House of Representatives. We used to, have, until last year, we had um, 53, now we have 52. So. People have left California. I mean, our population is still going up, but compared to other states, our growth is slower. Why is that? You know, you can point to different reasons. Um, for one, you know, uh, California has high taxes, especially on businesses. So we've seen some businesses go to other states. Um, with COVID-19, we've seen people, some people leave the state for cheaper property because they can work from home, et cetera. So, <clears throat> Excuse me again, sorry guys. 
um, struggling through this. For whatever reason, California's population has declined in um, relation to other states. So we lost a seat. But again, the House of Representative seats, how many seats your state gets is based on population. And if you remember from our, our first or second lecture, this is based on the Connecticut or Great Compromise in which everyone gets two seats in the Senate and the House um, is based on population. So if you want to run for the House of Representatives, you only have to be 25 years old, That's, although it is very rare to get someone in their 20s. Um, it does happen, though. Um, you have to be a U.S. citizen for at least seven years. You don't have to be a natural born citizen just for at least seven years. And you must be an inhabitant of the state you represent, meaning you can't represent New York if you live in California. Right? You have to spend a certain amount of time per year in that state. Um, you can't be what they call a carpet bagger. So House leadership, how is the structure of the House run? Well, the person in charge of the House of Representatives is the Speaker of the House. Um, our current Speaker of the House, current and former, is Nancy Pelosi, a representative from California. I'm sure you know who she is. Uh, the Speaker is the Chief Administrative Officer of the House, of course, elected by the majority party. Currently, the Democrats control both the House and the Senate, so they elected Pelosi as the Speaker of the House. Interestingly, um, the Speaker of the House is actually second in line for the presidency. So let's say, the, God forbid, uh, the president passes away and the vice president is also somehow killed. The Speaker of the House would then become president of the United States. So she, um, she's currently second in line of secession in power for president. What else does the Speaker of the House do? They set the agenda. They have the power to determine which bills are considered and where. Right, so they send bills to committees. Um, they have the power to at least, um, which is huge, right? Because they can send a bill they want to pass to a friendly committee um, and vice versa. So a lot of power comes in selecting which committee bills can go to. And they also assign committee chairs and which members go to which committee, which again is a lot of power because there are certain committees that are more powerful than others that people want, that con congressmen and women want. So you can kind of stack up favors in that way, or at least control the internal politics of the House if you're the Speaker. The second in command is the House Majority Leader. That is currently Steny Hoyer, which is, of course, a very unique name. Um, he's out of Maryland. Um, Steny Hoyer acts as the floor manager, negotiating spokesperson, tracks party members, serves at the discretion, um, <coughs> excuse me, of the Speaker of the House, um, but of course is second in command. Third in command would be the House Whip. Now there are, um, I wanna point out, um, majority and minority leaders and majority and minority whips. So the Republicans have a majority leader as well, even though they're not controlling the House and they have a whip. But since we're talking about um, the, the, the House Whip, let's talk about the party in control. That would be Jim Clyburn, who I believe is out of South Carolina. Um, he is currently the, House, the Democratic House Whip, and he is third in command. When you think of the House Whip, um, there are duties and responsibilities. Think about whipping someone into shape, making sure your party votes by party line. So, um, you know, if there's an important vote coming up, the House Whip might meet with certain members of the House and say, hey, can we count your vote? We need a, you know, X number of votes to make sure this gets approved. Um, make sure that they're voting with their party loyalty. Okay, so that wraps it up for the House. Let's now move on to the Senate. So the House of Representatives, the lower chamber, the upper chamber is the Senate. Senate has 100 members, two from every state. Again, that is a result of the Connecticut Compromise when they were creating the Constitution of the United States. They have six-year terms, um, but the elections are staggered so that one third of senators are up for re-election every two years. Okay, so every six years, you'll have more or less a complete turnaround. Now, of course, the Senate is run statewide, not by district. So California with its 52 seats are broken in the House are broken up in districts. It's not like that in the Senate, you run for the entire state and only two people are chosen. And once again, they run in six year terms. Some of the important powers of the Senate they approve presidential appointees. I mentioned this earlier. This is huge. And this is not just Supreme Court members or federal court members in general. 
any presidential appointee must be approved from the Senate, by the Senate, I should say, from a lowly aide, you know, maybe he gets coffee, chips in every once in a while, that also to, to the Supreme Court, they all must be approved by the Senate, um, and again, including Supreme Court nominees, which we've seen a lot of drama um, in these uh, confirmations in the last 10 years or so. Um, also, another important power is, of course, um, impeachment. So both the House and the Senate play a role in impeachment. The House representatives must decide whether or not they want to impeach the president. Um, the House votes. If they vote majority yes, um, the president is then impeached. It goes to the Senate, who ultimately decides whether or not to kick the president out of office. Okay. So when you hear Donald Trump was impeached twice, that doesn't mean he was kicked out of office twice. It just means the House voted to impeach him twice. Um, in Donald Trump's case, the Senate voted uh, not to uphold that impeachment, not to kick him out of office. So when we talk about the Senate, and this is very topical, we have to mention something called a filibuster. And maybe you've heard of it, but in the Senate, they have the ability to delay votes or at least to attempt to delay proceedings with this act called the filibuster. Essentially, it's delaying a vote by speaking. So there's no rules on how long you can debate a, a bill in the Senate. So what will end up happening sometimes is senators will go up there and just talk and talk and talk and as long as they can, and as long as they're up there speaking on their own free will, you know, they just stand up, they can't eat or drink or leave. As long as they're able to do that, they can talk as long as they want. Um, the longest filibuster ever is, I believe, around 23 hours. Um, so, you know, very long. Um, and, and the point here, again, is to delay the vote, but also to kind of get a national audience behind you say, look, this is where we're making a stand. It's a tool often used by the minority party in Congress, okay? Now, the only way to get around a filibuster is to have what we call a vote of closure, meaning 60 senators have to vote to end the filibuster. So 60 out of 100 senators must say, okay, this has to end. Now, Senate races are very tight. Normally it's 51-49 or 52-48. So to get the 60 votes needed is almost impossible. So filibusters can be a very effective way to block legislation from going through the Senate, okay? Now, if you have any more questions on filibusters, please reach out to me. I know it can get a little complex. And in fact, I have a little example here for you of a filibuster. Now, this is Ted Cruz, who I'm sure you've heard of. He ran for president in 2016. Um, this is him filibustering, and he's reading the child, Dr. Seuss Children's Book, Green Eggs and Ham. So in your filibuster, I should mention, you don't have to talk about the bill at hand. He's, he's filibustering Obamacare, I believe, uh, something related to Obamacare. You don't, have to, you don't have to discuss that. You can go up there and read the phone book. But as long as you're standing on your own cognition, you have the floor. And you can't be told to, to leave unless there's a vote of closure. So kind of a weird, unique American politic thing we do. But the filibuster is quite controversial for this reason. OK, so we talked about House leadership. Let's talk about Senate, Senate leadership. There is a Senate leader, but more or less the true leader of the Senate is the vice president, right? But the vice president will often only show up to the Senate floor when there is a really important vote. Why is that? Because the vice president, Kamala Harris in this case, is the tie-breaking vote in the Senate. So there's 100 senators, right? Let's say there's a 50-50 vote. Kamala Harris will then be able, will make the deciding vote on which way that bill will go, okay? So the vice president presides over the chamber in the Senate. Um, much like the House, there is also Senate majority and minority party leaders and party whips. Um, so as I mentioned before, uh, the Founding Fathers really thought that Congress would probably be the strongest branch of government. They're seen as really representing the people. The House being the direct delegates of the people, right? They're elected every two years. They directly represent what we want, our wants, desires, and needs. And the Senate seen as more of trustees of our will. We give you more room. We give you six years to kind of do our will, and then we'll reevaluate in those six years. But both important houses, 
And again, I'm curious to what you think. Is Congress currently the most powerful branch of government? You know, I think an argument could be made that from anywhere it's the most powerful to the least powerful. And I don't think it could be wrong for any argument. Now, another interesting thing about Congress is because it's bicameral, it's very difficult to pass laws. It's very difficult to pass amendments. And the checks and balance process makes it even more difficult. So oftentimes we'll have, I mean, right now we have a Democratic House and Senate, but oftentimes the House will be Republican, the Senate, Democrat, and vice versa. So it's very difficult for them to work together. Even if they do and they pass a bill through both the House and the Senate, the president can still veto that. The president can refuse to sign the, the bill into law, which is a veto. So congressional uh, responsibilities are very difficult. Um, congressional approval ratings tend to be extremely low, and maybe that's why, because their job is difficult. But we've also seen a lot of pettiness from Congress um, as of late. So other important aspects of Congress, um, important powers we need to discuss before we move on. Uh, I want to talk about elastic clause and enumerated powers. These are where the federal government, where Congress gets a lot of their powers and responsibilities. The necessary and proper, proper clause, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, says Congress has the power to make laws that are necessary and proper to carry out its powers best in the Constitution. So this might as well be called the vague clause, right? What does that even mean? Congress has the power to make laws that are necessary and proper to carry out its powers best in the Constitution. Essentially what that's saying is Congress has the power to do what it must do to be effective, okay? So it's somewhat intentionally vague uh, to give Congress that power to carry out its constitutional powers. So enumerated powers versus assumed powers. I want you to know the difference between these two. Enumerated powers are those powers specifically given to Congress in the Constitution. Assumed powers are not specifically given in the Constitution, but are rather assumed to be given, okay? So some examples of enumerated powers, and again, these are powers given to Congress in the Constitution, the ability to tax, that is constitutional, it's written in the document, to go into debt, to print money, to declare war, to maintain a military, to re regulate interstate commerce. These are all enumerated powers, which again means they are written and specifically given to Congress in the Constitution of the United States versus assumed powers, which are not written in the Constitution. Okay, so that's gonna wrap up part A, lecture eight. Um, I will post part B as soon as I finish it. Thank you for tuning in.